Good afternoon and welcome to this special, special culture care event. Um, we are here to discuss art and faith with the artist Mako Fujimura and so excited that you could join us this afternoon. Uh, there's a ton of stuff to talk about, uh, but we're going to see how much we can get through. Uh, so to not waste any time, I'm just going to share a brief introduction of our guest and then we'll dive right in. Mako Fujimura is a leading contemporary artist whose process-driven refractive slow art has been described by David Brooks of the New York Times as a small rebellion against the quickening of time. His art's been featured widely in galleries and museums around the world and is actually part of the collections of numerous museums, including the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo, the Huntington Library, as well as the Ticketon Museum in Israel. Mako is also an arts advocate, writer, and speaker who's recognized worldwide as a cultural influencer. A presidential appointee to the National Council of the Arts from 2003 to 2009, Mako served as an international advocate for the arts, speaking with decision makers and advising governmental policies on the arts. His latest book, Art and Faith, A Theology of Making, was released on December 1st by Yale University Press, and it's about this new work that I'm so excited to speak to him about today. And so thanks for being here. Oh, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's great to see you. So to start off, some people might be watching today that really don't know about what you've written about culture care. Yeah. So maybe just give us a brief introduction of what that is and how this book in particular fits into your wider work. Yeah, thank you. Um, so culture care came out many years of me advocating for the arts. Um, you know, I was on the National Council uh, appointed by President Bush and I was sent all over um, uh, US to uh, advocate for US arts and, and why we should fund it as a governmental agency. And as you can well imagine in, in the landscape of culture wars, the arts become a uh, sort of of an unwitting frontal issue uh, where, you know, everything from modern Scorsese's film to, you know, any, anything artists are doing is suspect uh, for conservative perspective. And sure, sure. so, you know, I spent a lot of time, at, you know, just defending the arts and, and, and then um, the, that became a book, Culture Care, uh, instead of fighting culture wars, uh, we should look at culture as an ecosystem or garden to steward or tend to. And, um, you know, changing that metaphor alone, which is a proper way of doing, looking at culture rather than, you know, cultural battlegrounds and, and war um, uh, driven um, scarcity mindset um, uh, behind that and zero sum game that we end up fighting where you, 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 if you win culture wars, you lose. Uh, because you have successfully demonized the other side and, and reduced uh, the ideological of these principles into uh, something that uh, you reject. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, you know, even if you understand ideology in general or cultural structure in general, uh, that, that's not how culture works. And uh, the, each time you do the, that, you're actually poisoning the very land that you're standing on. So uh, you end up with a you know, shrink, shrinkage of your own turf by mm -hmm. doing that. If we win, <clears throat> next time you fight that battle, you're talking about something entirely different uh, that you never thought you would have to defend. And that's been the history of culture wars. And so Culture care as an antidote. Uh, it is not a battle against culture wars. Uh, you know, I understand there are principles and realities that we need to uh, fight for, of course, and defend. But but it's another way of looking at culture, which I think is more uh, productive. And uh, I could talk about generativity uh, in in the book as a way that anybody, um, you know, whether you identify yourself as a Christian or not, it it, it's, it it doesn't matter. Anybody can be part of this generative lifestyle that that creates a abundant uh, uh, realm. Um, but that, of, of course, that assumes that we have a abundant uh, reality behind creation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where the theology has to kick in. And um, when I speak in public to, let's say, uh, um, you know, non-Christian audience or whatever, uh, you know, uh, th this mixed audience, um, mm -hmm. I, I use culture care terms to advocate for this assumption of abundance that I have as a Christian. 
now people may say well that's you know that's like jumping into a, you know another planet but but really artists that I have spoken to, these are artists who have rejected the church, who have gone as far away as they can from Christianity as possible. Artists are still in uh, the assumption of abundance. Mm -hmm. um, the good ones, especially, they recognize that. So, so it's a common ground, common language that we can speak to culture at large. And you know you can understand their plights, you, the the reality that because they're um, facing a shrinkage of culture wars, they've been conscripted into the front lines of culture wars, mm -hmm. and they have been asked to play a role there, but they don't want that. Mm -hmm. Whether they, they are progressive or they're conservative, it doesn't matter. That that's not what they see their art to be used for. Um, instead, they want to broaden the language. They want to give humanity back to humans. And, and, and so, you know, my, my language of cultural care uh, is based on basically Generations 5, which I don't talk about in cultural care book, but it's the idea that, you know, fruit of the spirit is based on love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, you know, gentleness, goodness, good, uh, goodness and faithfulness and self-control. And, and the test of culture, culture at large is whether the fruit is being uh, birthed. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you ask anybody out there, um, uh, you know, when you look at, especially American culture, what is the fruit of, you know, uh, labor? Uh, our battles and and no one's going to say love no mm. one's going to say joy no one's going to say peace it's the opposite right instead of love we have hate hatred instead of uh joy we have anxiety instead of peace you know we we, we have this um intense battles going on um so what's going on you know and if we examine sociologically at least and culturally um even the culture w w within the church Mm. right especially culture within the church yes. it doesn't indicate the fruit of the spirit yes so we have to say that whatever we have been do doing in individual discipleship for many many years and in the churches and mega churches and uh, has largely failed to produce good cultural beautiful fruit um, that people want to line up to be part of um, so, the, you know, we, if we shift that conversation of reality of us not seeing the fruit mm -hmm. to what's causing it, well, that's where theology of making comes in because that, that's, that's the, um, uh, you know, way to understand the narrative of restoration has to be through the lens of creation and new creation. And if you look at it as a fixing industrial pro project only, uh, you know, you end up with something much, much less, and you end up fighting culture wars to, to justify your existence. And that, that's what I'm trying to do with a uh, new book as well. Mm, that's great. That's great. You kind of just alluded to it um, in what you were sharing, this idea you share in the book of, uh, of a plumbing theology, <laughs> and, and where, where that kind of um, falls short. I'd love for you to just share a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah with all the apologies to plumbers, you know, I, I, <laughs> I used to speak uh, about plumbing theology, and all, there, always somebody in the audience comes up to me, hey, I'm a plumber, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I say, you know, I, uh, it's just a metaphor, you know, I love plumbers, I, I want good plumbers, I don't <laughs> want Christian plumbers, I just want good plumbers, you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you kind of become suspicious when they use the word Christian as an adjective, but sure. anyway, um, um, you know, I, I liken uh, church services, in, uh, especially in the U.S. And, and, and really all over the world, as this perpetual um, you know, training for us to learn to fix the plumbing. Um, and we, we go to church and we learn new tools and we're supposed to learn that and be able to fix our pipes and then go tell our neighbor that there's this new tool, amazing, you know, you should come with me to church. And they learn and they go and they, they invite others. And, and, and at very few times you, you even hear about, so why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Like the assumption is like, you're supposed to fix the pipes. Okay, but like, why are we doing it? Like what's going through the pipes? 
and and what is the meaning of like what happens when we fix the pipes mm -hmm. right what are we supposed to do then so, so, you know, Christians have the uh, evangelical movement has typically been like, okay, so you pray this prayer and then you, and you, you know, you get to go to heaven, right? Mm -hmm. So that's really plumbing, you know, like, okay, here's a tool, you know, for mm -hmm. spiritual laws or whatever. And, and you, you, you know, you, your discipleship then becomes, you know, be filled with the spirit and so forth, go to church, you know. And, and, but, but that's, that's still fixing the pipes, right? It, it doesn't really talk about like, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, right. and so, so when I read, uh, especially N.T. Wright's theology, right? And he talks about the uh, narrative of the gospel being, being too truncated in, in it, especially in uh, recent times. And we need to push it back into creation, new creation. You know, I was like, of course, you know, that, that makes total sense. Like after Pentecost, what do we do? Like we just tell people like about Jesus, right? And, and you know, I, many times the preaching is like this, you know, everything is going to burn, burn up. So you have to, you know, get people to be saved, uh, you know, trust in the word of God and grow. But what are you growing to? <laughs> There's no explanation. Like, okay, we've got the pipes, you know, fixed. Now what? Right. right. So, right. Um, you know, I, I really, uh, you know, it's, I call it a utilitarian pragmatism, which is, uh, is a kind of, uh, you know, ideology that came out of industrial revolution that, you know, you're supposed to make stuff uh, uh, as efficiently and as, as you know, uh, cheaply as possible and, and try to get to the masses, right? It's like, you know, cars and refrigerators and so forth. And we've done that with the gospel. We became these, these sales people, uh, perhaps effective, mm -hmm. but, but we haven't told them like what the car is for. <laughs> like, where is it going? Um, and, and so theology of making is to broaden that and say, actually, God has invited you to be a creator, a maker. Uh, in fact, uh, I use this word carefully, but, you know, co-creating is, is an invitation given by God, not that we can be God, but because mm -hmm. we are, you know, like that boy in, in the beach creating sandcastle that's going to get washed away. But the father is this architect and loves that design. And he has the power to make something out of the design that he, his, his child, because he loves his child, because, and, and the child has a unique way of looking at the world. The father is going to only amplify that effort to create a sandcastle and make it real, you know, make it mm -hmm. enduring, make it something that is permanent. Mm -hmm. And and so this relationship of co-creating is is really, you know, biased toward the creator. But but nevertheless, you know, if we think that that's outrageous, if we think that is uh, too extravagant, too too good to be true, then we're getting the message mm -hmm. because God is truly inviting us, His children to be co-creators, even though we can only build sandcastles and it's going to get washed away. Mm -hmm. And you trace that all the way back to the garden. You know, yes. I read, in the book, you talk about God giving Adam the ability yes. to name the animals. It's yes. his, you know, God made the animals, but then he's actually giving them names that it, you know, you know, we, we use the word authority and we struggle with that word, but you know, authority is authority. Right. So uh, what Adam did was the first poetic act, but it was also an act of authority. It was an act of co-creation because it, it was a way that God has given authority to Adam to name the animals and God didn't change, you know, then say, well, uh, I don't think giraffe works for this animal, you know. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Whatever Adam said stuck, right? And that, that, that is a significant part of God's um, invitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. One of the things you talk about that I, I just, you know, you're, you're very fair in saying that, um, you know, their sin is real, like we still yeah. all struggle, yeah. but yet you really push, um, you push us to, to surrender to the spirit yes. and, and um, trusting where God leads us. And I was wondering, uh, you know, to the degree that you can maybe share how, how do we discern, you know, when we're being led by the right impulses uh, especially in in such a like you said a lavish theology of 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 running with with 
this God who's inviting us in to do these yes, things? Yes. Well, that's a great question. And, and I, I think part of it is, is doing this, right? Is having a communion with your brothers and sisters, having a family that is, you know, using their wings, you know, rather than trying to jump higher and higher, as Lewis's example of a horse being trained, you know, Christianity is not a uh, moralism that, um, you know, trains the horses to jump higher and higher, but Christianity is God giving wings to mm -hmm. for these horses to fly. And we need people who are flying with us. We can't go solo. Uh, it's it's rather dangerous <laughs> because, you know, we don't, we don't know, the, we don't have a map, <laughs> you know, and we need each other's gifts to identify identify what, what, what are we doing, you know, once we have that power, uh, because it, it is, it is very powerful. We can, you know, we can create something uh, beautiful, something beautiful um, and enduring or something uh, like, you know, weapons of mass destruction. I mean, those are uses of imagination in the same way of, you know, using those wings. And um, so power is very dangerous. And, um, you know, we need to understand that as, as fellow, you know, uh, sojourners uh, into the new. And so we need accountability, we need, you know, um, uh, a way to sanctify imaginations together. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and that, that's probably part of the discernment. I, I would also think that if God has given, uh, gifted you with expression of any kind, um, you know, and that, <clears throat> that gift, um, if it's turned toward the self, will ultimately limit itself. Mm -hmm. But if it's generously given to the world as a gift uh, to the world, um, and, and there's nothing wrong with making a living off of your work or commoditizing it in some way, but really ultimately it's still a gift. And, and you have to always have community that allows that gift to thrive. And I, I think the church community is an ideal medium or vehicle in, through which somebody, you know, a creative artist sitting in the corner can find a home because the God, you know, this God that we worship is the artist, you know, mm -hmm. so, so there's a bias toward making. And exactly. if, if, if this artist, you know, wearing black and, you know, and, and has tattoos all over her, uh, is, 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 is somebody who has rejected the gospel, rejected the church, uh, praise God. I mean, that, that's begin there. Let's begin with the brokenness. Let's let's hear her songs and 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 allow that to speak to us. And perhaps that can resonate in lives of many people who see themselves as religious and righteous, but they also have brokenness as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, which actually leads into this idea of kintsugi theology. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's something you you coin in this book, and I'd love for you to just share a little bit of. What, you, what that means and how it relates to resurrection. Absolutely. Uh, I have been making these uh, kintsugi boxes here in the studio and um, they, um, I can show you this one. This one is a uh, Korean rice ball that has been mended by a kintsugi master here. Mm. And so what happens with kintsugi is, you know, uh, important uh, ceramic uh, ball may break uh, the family of tea master will keep the fragments for generations and they will give it to a Japan lacquer master, Urushi master, and the, the Urushi master will uh, use Japan lacquer to mend it, but also to highlight the fractures with gold. Uh, uh, and so you see, you see that highlighted here. Mm. And, and so you don't hide the flaws, you uh, in fact accentuate it and the resulting bowl is far more valuable than the original. <laughs> so it, it's a beautiful the theological statement, I think, um, that, that actually um, gets hold of uh, the reality of brokenness that we live in. And the Western mindset, right? If, if the Western uh, repairer will take this is, is to repair it so you can't see that it's been broken. The Japanese mindset is to do the opposite, you know, which is mm -hmm. accentuate the fractures. 
And, um, you know, I work with a Kintsugi master in Japan to um, make these bowls and, and I've been designing these boxes as part of the Kintsugi Academy, uh, which, which, which was launched, uh, as, I, I guess, as part of Theology of Making Project because I needed to have a way where people can easily access their somatic knowledge. And, and it just, it just Kintsugi is, is, uh, has been, you know, a secret tradition for a long time with, you know, only uh, Urushi master who's been doing it for 20 years can do Kintsugi. And I met a Kintsugi master who decided after 3-11 tsunami disaster uh, in Japan that um, he wanted to teach Japanese children, orphan children, this method because he felt, he felt that it would help them to heal, uh, you know, with their hands. And so not only he wanted to bring Kintsugi, but he didn't want to do it himself. He wanted to teach them how to do it. So he came up with a un unique uh, new Urushi, which is based on cashew nuts rather than poison sumac. And um, so anybody can learn to do this now. And we have, a, we have kids and so forth now training uh, people to you know, uh, learn to do that and, and, and spread community around that. And, and so Kintsugi, uh, you know, I have a chapter on Kintsugi because, you know, I call it Kintsugi theology, um, is, is a way to look at uh, our brokenness differently. Um, and, you know, rather than saying Jesus came to fix you and, and to make you whole again, you know, um, you, you say, no, Jesus wounds after the post, post you know, post resurrection, Jesus has still has wounds in, it, in, in his hands. And, uh, and, and it's, that's very significant. Like, like, so what happened, you know, his sacrifice on the cross um, uh, remains in new creation. And perhaps it is through those wounds that we are healed and through those wounds that light can, you know, through the cracks, the light can come in. Um, if, if we apply that to our lives and our churches, we will have an entire, you know, a shift in how we look at brokenness, how, how we invite people with, um, you know, broken paths. Um, uh, you know, if, if, we can, if we can be like a Kintsugi master, right, who would hold on to the fragments and look at it, behold the fragments, even before he or she can fix it, they would look at it and admire it and, and say, this is beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, before, you know, you go about you know, mending and creating these rivers of gold and because that experience of naming the fragments is the first step in you know restoring and then creating something new. Mm. So if we did that in our churches, I mean imagine you know somebody a fragment coming into our churches and mm. saying instead of saying you know we have programs for you know whatever, we say no, uh, you're beautiful. Mm -hmm. We want to just behold you, just mm -hmm. just embrace who you are, just as you are right now. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you don't need to do anything. You know, you know, we're here for you. You know, and that, that kind of attitude shift can, I think, can drastically change how hospitality of local churches, how how we actually carry out the work of the gospel. Um, you know, which I talk about in the book, beauty and mercy are two ways that that can, that cannot survive. Uh, Darwinian, you know, battles. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's why God made it essential for the church. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you reminded me of the, the woman at the well and the way yeah. that Jesus treats her, you know, yes, like he's, exactly. she's coming to avoid being yes. seen. And yes. she, she sounds like that artist you described who's, you yeah. know, uh, ostracized from everyone. <laughs> and he just he, he's with her, you know, yeah. let, let, let's drink water together, even though right. I'm a man and you're a woman, I'm a teacher. And you right. know, all of this is forbidden, but. And he names the fragments. He says, you know, you have been with, you know, so many husbands and, mm -hmm. and yeah, that wasn't just judgment. It was, it was a reality check. Mm -hmm. And, and she, he was inviting her in, mm -hmm. into a new reality. Yeah. 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 That's, that's powerful. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you argue that before the fall, we were all artists and poets. I'm wondering, 
<laughs> I'm wondering if you feel that that holds true after the fall and yeah. how, how are we all artists in some way? Yeah, so there's, you know, everybody's an artist until third grade, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and then somebody tells us like, you're not good at this and, and we believe them, you know, and, and there's, there's a level of that that's, that's important. You know, you're, not everybody, you know, can, can, you know, sing opera, but, but, you know, but, but each one of us has given, given a unique, um, imprint and and we we are supposed to explore what that means what is our expression and what is our art um, whether you're a plumber or <laughs> engineer or scientist or you know a teacher the, these things matter uh, because it, it's ultimately uh, the test of knowledge mm -hmm. is by making we, if we can't make anything then we it doesn't matter how 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 many classes you take in a seminary right it, it if you can't make whether it be a sermon community or you know church um uh, you know all that you know is not being actuated in actualized in the world so you know that's the real test and mm -hmm. then and then the second test would be fruitfulness of the way you made. Uh, does it generate more response, you know, uh, by people who are uh, part of observing it or appreciating it or whatever? And and um, so the, you know, I, I think we we've got gotten so far away, especially in our education, to um, dismiss uh, our, our childlike art artistry. And, uh, a naivete that was all, all there, right? We suppressed it all our lives. And we said, you know, no, that's not important. I have to do this. I have to earn the income. I have to be pract practical. Now paying rent, is there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, w why are you doing that? Again, the plumbing thing, you know, why are you doing that? I, I, are you doing that so that you can enjoy the new wine coming in through your pipes? Or are you doing it simply so that so the you know the, the pipe remains uh, fixed from the outside and and looks shiny, you know, yeah. and and those those are important questions that we we ask. So it doesn't matter what the occupation is. I I, I do think everybody is 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 an artist with a small a, and uh, including including myself. And uh, you know, the more you get at the heart of creation, the the less you understand about this, and more mysterious it becomes. Mm, that's great. So my wife is obsessed with this show on Netflix called The Repair Shop. Oh, uh, <laughs> I heard about this. Yeah, so you basically are introduced to different people who bring these precious objects that have been a part of their life, sometimes yeah. for multiple generations. Wow. Um, one episode, there's a broken music box that, that survived the bombing during World War II. And wow. um, interestingly enough, they don't... Um, they don't, she doesn't want it to be fully repaired. She wants it to work, but she wants the wounds from the bomb to remain. Wow. Yeah. And, um, and so they honor that as they reconstruct it. Wow. I'm wondering, you talk a little bit about, you know, this wallet in the book. I'm wondering why do yeah. you think, you know, worn objects, what do they mean? Why do they mean so much to us? And like, what is, what's going on there? Uh, you know, it's so interesting. So Nakamura-san, the Kintsugi master um, says, you know, why would people bring in to the Kintsugi repair workshop, you know, these uh, objects like toys that costed them, let's say $10 but they would pay like a hundred dollars to do this Kinsey workshop. <laughs> like, isn't that dumb, the economy of that? It doesn't make sense. Right? right. So there's something about memory that, um, that creates a, uh, uh, maybe a trigger response that to something deeper within. And uh, I have been doing, um, you know, my, my rector asked me, can you do a Kintsugi workshop in an hour because they have a Christian formation class? And I said, no, that, that would be difficult, but I can do show and tell. <laughs> he, said, he said, what's that? I said, it was the same idea. You know, you bring in something that's, that's been worn down like wabi sabi idea you know something that means something to you like old photograph it doesn't matter what you know and and you just share and what's amazing is that in the zoom reality that we live in you know we're zoomed out but when you start to do that uh you're being invited into each other's homes first mm -hmm. of all 
and and then you're sharing something that's that's meaningful to you. So uh, one time, uh, you know, this this lady that I have known, uh, you know, my eight o'clock service, you know, that maybe group of fifteen people come say, you know, eight o'clock service, but I I never knew knew her name, right? Mm -hmm. so it was just past peace and. You know, you go home, right? And and so I was doing show and tell, and she she kind of raised her hand and she said, "I have something." And I said, "You know, yeah, bring your you know object." And it was this old stuffed dog. It was like it was literally you couldn't even tell that it was dog anymore, mm. uh, with a tail, you know, like you know, really almost gone. And um, and she said, you know, I was going to throw this out and I just couldn't. She's, she's in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, you know, when you, when, you, when you said, you know, bring something precious, I, I just immediately thought of it. And uh, this was a dog that I um, begged my parents to get. She grew up in Ireland and uh, in a poor area. And she begged and begged and begged because a local merchant was selling these dogs that, that was handmade. And uh, she finally got it for Christmas. And... Um, she went to bed every night holding it and chewing the tail. Oh, wow. <laughs> so she's just showing this, right? Her name is Kathy. I, I now know her name. Um, and she said, you know, it's amazing what this brings to me, um, uh, you know, now that I look back. And, um, and, I, and, and everybody on Zoom kind of got, you know, be way past the, wall you know it was it was like as if we were entering to her home as if we were entering to her childhood as if we identified with her uh you know her journey into america all of that just just came you know like like and and it, it's it was an unforgettable moment and in these moments right so going back to objects how carrying memories there's something about this that we have dismissed in industrial you know uh, like because we get new iPhones every year, you know, kind of thing. Um, we we lost sight of um, the attachment that we have toward physical objects, and that's part. It has to be related to a somatic knowledge, right? That we we are hungering for uh, today. Uh, so so we we learn things by information, you know, left, right, up, down. Uh, you know, my friend Kurt Thompson, uh, uh, a clinical psychologist, says no, actually, the learning is the other way, uh, bottom up, right, left, right. Mm -hmm. So we learn by hand, touching that that animal, chewing it, <laughs> and and then you know something happens that travels upward to the affective part that cultivates our loves. And then that then it gets translated into irrational actions. Mm. And sometimes irrational actions will shut down the other part. So we have to retrain how we learn, right, from bottom up. And I think when that happens, whether it be Kintsugi workshop or you know, lady show and tell the stuffed animal, something triggers something. I, and I think Kurt would say that a new neuron is developing in this very frazzled, fractured uh, brain of ours now, you know, zoomed out and burnt out uh, with, you know, all the social media, um, something starts to generate. And, and that, that is what can heal us ultimately. Mm, that's great. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit, you know, where you've just mentioned it with Zoom, you know, we're in a, a, a strange time this, this past year with everything going on around the world and, and a lot of things even internally. So even beyond the pandemic, all of the, the racial injustice and yes. um, just, just a lot of unease within the church, politics, I mean, every, everywhere. Um, I just wanted to move into a discussion about some of the, the, the weightiness that you you, you, you know, dive into in the book. And I wanted to start with the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Yeah. You know, why is that so significant? And how does that impact your theology of making? Yeah, so um, that's the pinhole through which I write this book. In fact, the, the book is one third of what I have written. And mm -hmm. my editor, uh, Kath, Kath, Kathy Helmers, uh, went through it and carefully, like, patch together so it makes sense you know <laughs> it's kind of this but but what's consistent throughout this whole effort is jesus wept the shortest passage you know in john 11 35 and um and i 
I, I talk about this uh, at the length. I, I think I dedicate like three or four chapters in the book uh, because it's so important to me. And it's a passage that I go, but keep going back to during Lent and season to reflect on. And I keep discovering new things. I've been doing this for like close to 15 years. You know, I, that Amazing. two words, two words, like, like what, how could it be so powerfully generative. And the reason why it's so powerful to me is because um, there was no rational reason why he should have wept at that moment. You know, he just came to Bethany. He told his disciples, I'm going to delay my coming. So Lazarus will have to go through that. He will he'll, he'll be asleep and I'm going to wake, you know, resurrect him, temporarily resurrect him to show off the power of God, right? So, so why did he waste his time weeping with Mary? Mm. It makes no sense, right? I mean, I, if I was, you know, uh, uh, right there, I would say, Mary, uh, faith, have faith in God. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll show you God's mm -hmm. power. You know, come to the grave. I'm going to show, show forth and Lazarus, you know, come out, right? He didn't do that. He wasted, <laughs> he literally wasted time weeping with him. Um, and when you think about that and you think about, um, the non-utility maybe of that. Uh, um, and yet it's Mary, from Mary's perspective, she completely got this because she, you know, for her, what she needed was not the rational discourse, the answer of why he came late as he gave the explanation to more analytical Martha, her sister, but she didn't need an explanation. Um, she needed a friend. She needed somebody who understood her tears. And Jesus didn't say a word, you know. Um, um, you know, so the word, word of God stood silent on the hills of Bethany weeping. And um, Jesus um, simply spent time, wasted his time um, with Mary weeping. And her response was, different than Martha's, right? So, so the Ma Martha would probably have been involved in unwrapping Lazarus and, you know, making sure everything, everybody's doing the, you know, the, the doing part, right? And right, Mary, right. Mary, Mary's running to uh, get her uh, the, the most precious object that she has at her, at her house, you know, to, to the wedding now that she was supposed to save up for her wedding, um, you know, a year's worth of wages, so $50,000 bottle, you know, and, and she comes to waste this upon Jesus because Jesus, she knew, instinctively knew, We'll have to suffer for this. We'll have to go through, um, you know, something horrible uh, in order to become a king, anointed king. And she needed to anoint him. And and so the her, the tears of Christ, which uh, you know, I I always imagine it to be part of what I do. Um, I paint with Christ's tears because, you know, I, I say like, well, it's it's not just anybody's tears, it's, it's Christ's tears. So it must have multiplied, right, the, 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 into the air. And we're, we're bathing in it, in, in, in our suffering in 2020 pandemic and racial unrest and all that. Jesus weeps for us, stands with us in our pain, doesn't fix it sometimes because it, it it is something that is in due course, will be fixed, but it's not, that's not the point. The point is God's presence in, in, in the fractures and in, in between time when, when God, you know, Holy Saturday presence of, we, you know, between Good Friday and Easter, that there is, there is this presence of God in that sacred place. And that's perhaps one of the most critical times that we as humans can literally um, stand with God and, and, and to receive God's, uh, God's tears. Uh, tears are precious. In the Middle East, there are things called tear jars uh, that people collected people's tears because it was, it was such an important, sacred reality. Um, so how much is Jesus's tears worth? You know, uh, infinitely more than Mary's Nord. But Mary understood that what she has to do, what she can, to anoint this king, and um, and you know the the most beautiful thing that I, I think about is uh, you know because Jesus didn't have uh, between the Garden of Gethsemane betrayal and his trial, he he couldn't um, 
you know, cleanse himself going into Jerusalem first time in his life that he couldn't do that, the ceremonial washing uh, to enter Jerusalem. So those anointed aroma would, would he carried it with, with him to the cross. Mm. And, and that, that, that's the only earthly possession he took to the cross. Uh, was Mary's nod. So this 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 whole passage is, is, is explosive to me. And and uh, Stephen Garber, uh, you know, friend of ours, uh, have said that you know if it wasn't for Jesus wept, he would not be a Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I I agree with him that that there's something about that passage which is so. You know, if you're writing uh, a religious text, you know that that's like like that's crazy you don't you don't put those things in there that that makes no sense you know mm-hmm. <laughs> but, yeah. but to me it's the essence of the gospel yeah I, I love that it's something you know if anyone needs encouragement to spend time in scripture the fact that that is so familiar to you and yet for you to come back to it year after year yeah. and find new is such a powerful thing oh, and yeah. Um, yeah i hope yeah. that's that's an encouragement well it will mean something this year right i mean the, the next lenten season as we reflect on 2020 i mean jesus wept i mean what what does it mean in in all of the fractures we we've experienced yeah 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 and and um you know this whole book you know what would you want to say to hearts that are broken right now by the loss and the inequality and the brokenness in light of this book you know yeah well you know when i wrote it and we talked about publishing it you know i, I certainly wasn't expecting that we would be going through this year and and yet you know theology and new creation makes sense to those who are I've gone through this. Um, you know, I talk, to, talk about my experience going through 9-11 as a uh, resident, uh, ground zero resident. My, my kids uh, grew up as ground zero, you know, children. Um, but I remember, you know, going through the initial adrenaline, right? It runs out in about two, three months. And um, you just can't do it anymore. You go through depression and you go through, and uh, and then you realize, you know, after a while, you you are actually a survivor, you know, you, and and then, then you go through that survivor's guilt, and you know, you you do all the uh, lamenting and grieving, um, and you go through the cycle of anger, and you know, so forth. But um, now we're all going to be survivors after 2020. Uh, you know, every single person on this earth. Uh, are survivors after 2020. So, so the, the psychological ramification of this is going to be huge uh, for the church, especially because you know years later, the the you know sometimes the kintsugi has these hairline fractures, right, that you can't see. Mm. Um, and that you know, so so you put water in it, it starts leaking, and you you, start, you just repair it, you know. But no, there's there's hidden wounds that that you couldn't see and those things are going to surface in in the years to come three four four years later 20 years later i'm still sensing that hairline fractures of 9 11. uh you know and i i I thought i had mended that but no it's still there so uh how do we guide people through that time and how do we pay attention to those fractures um, knowing that, and, and fully anticipating that that will be there in people's lives, and and we and the good thing about this is that we can share in that. You know, mm-hmm. night ever after night ever. You know, if you were a resident below Canal Street, you know, you didn't have to know each other's name. You knew exactly what they were going through, and you you had an instantaneous bond with that person. If somebody says, "I lived in Warren Street in night ever." I, I know what you went through, right? So, so it's gonna be like that with 2020. Um, and so we, we have an opportunity to connect deeply with those who are suffering, who lost their loved ones, who, who are struggling because of the you know, after effects of COVID, getting COVID. It, it, those, those things can be part of a new creation, right? So because the wounding, the fracture is an entry point. It's, you know, you don't patch it up. You know, we, we, we are able to share that experience because everybody knows 
God willing, right? Uh, if you can be vulnerable with that, uh, if we can be open, if we can acknowledge that as a starting point and not to ignore it, uh, dismiss it, um, then then we, we will be able to create something beautiful out of it. But we have to be patient and we have to um, help each other to get there. Yeah, what a, what a powerful uh, upside down way, I think, of seeing, you know, this yeah this situation that in a time of such division yeah. could be something this difficult, this, this awful that provides entryways to, to listen to one another, to come together, yeah. love one another in ways that we haven't in the past, which is yeah, yeah. mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. Well, my friend of mine said 2020 is 2020, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's given us clarity. It's given us a reality check. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our vulnerabilities, our mortalities, um, and, and technology's flaws, and, and certainly, uh, uh, you know, uh, racial um, uh, issues that keeps resurfacing um, over and over. Mm -hmm. um, so it's 2020, and what do we do with that vision of mm -hmm. clarity? Uh, that's, that's the work that we will be, um, you know, working on, I think, in the, in mm -hmm. the coming days. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things, you know, I, I've been hearing a lot in this season is is kind of like a tension with people in the midst of so much um, suffering, kind of dismissing like art, like we need we need food on our table, you know, we need yes. um, work and, and that's true. Um, yeah. But yet the, you also hear that everyone's watching shows, they're watching films, they're reading, they're, yeah. um, they're going to museums virtually to see yeah. art. Yeah. And I'm wondering why you think that tension exists, that we would yeah. say it's not important and then not recognize that so much of our time is actually being fed by. Yeah. Just yeah. <laughs> These guys who watch, you know, couldn't watch March Madness is making sourdough bread, you know? <laughs> like, how did that happen? Like, why, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, <laughs> and it's, we're makers, you know? We, we need to make this on a deep hunger for making. Of course, we need roof over our heads and and you know the basic needs are there and that's not to be dismissed um we need safety we need, we need to protect each other but you know I, I think at the end of the day you know if you don't have beauty you will not survive uh you will end up um you know i i have three children uh ground zero uh children and um, all three have had at least two friends commit suicide in, in the post 10 years um, after 9-11. Um, uh, so they survived 9-11, but they didn't survive the despair after 9-11. So, so uh, that's going to happen, you know, and if, if we're not making, in, in, you know, generating something new into the world, you will lose hope. Um, and, you know, it's, it's almost like a requirement for human beings to, to be able to, you know, have their own way. You, they may, you may not have a studio like I do. I'm, I'm privileged to have. Yeah, but, but you have ways of making something new into the world. And um, it, it, we, we have to be very proactive in seeking that and developing that and, and cultivating that. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, if anything, if you're not making your most surety be consuming something that somebody else made um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong, I suppose, with, cons with consumption, but, but we, we are learning, right, that, that this is, there's a limit to how much that can fulfill us. And, um, and if you're going to, you know, order something on Amazon, make something with it you know mm -hmm. <laughs> right so so the cycle has to become more generative and life-giving and and um you know we we really um i think that's the, the lesson of 2020 is that we're all makers and mm -hmm. you know we can we can begin now to begin uh, and and theologically this is good news because yeah. what we make matters to god even yeah. though it may disappear um, uh, God remembers and that is a profound reality of new creation that uh, gives us hope uh, in, in, in when we're faced with scarcity when we're faced with you know reality that uh, we're not quite sure um, how to handle you know an overwhelming reality that, that comes upon us despair um, you know we can still say 
you know, I'm, I'm going to do my small <laughs> faithful act of making today. No one may see it, but it, it, you know, I believe that the biblical account tells us that it matters and God sees and anything built on the foundation of Christ is going to be sanctified by the fire and, and made into the new and new creation. It's going to be multiplied. You know, um, so so that that's something that I, I hope my book can encourage people to think about uh, and, and, and practice in their communal ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, a friend, I think a mutual friend, Tiffany Thompson, the musician, yes. she on Friday, she did a concert in her in her walk up yeah. and, and opened up the door. Yeah. And everyone was on their landing and. Yeah. It came about by a neighbor saying, you know, I, I sometimes stand outside your door to hear you singing. <laughs> and and yeah, became a concert, you know, yeah. uh, among strangers uh, yeah. in a time of separation. You yeah, know, and she has some, such a strong voice that I can mm -hmm. see that being true. And that's so great that she yeah. was, yeah. I, I just wanted to end with, you know, you've talked about new creation. There's a, a, a story in the book that moved me so much towards the end about an example of that when you were in yeah. Japan. And I was yeah. wanting that to end maybe just sharing, yeah. put it, putting like flesh and bones on yeah. what, what that looks like in our lives. Um, right. So Susie Vera and Andrew Nema are there, both Ted Fellows and friend of mine. And uh, with Susie, we, we've done uh, uh, multiple uh, collaborations, her music and, and my art. And in fact, we, we just did a podcast with her where uh, Culture Care created a podcast where we uh, uh, kind of traced her steps because she has such a wonderful soundscape uh, to everything she does. And Andrew Nemer is a tap dancer, a pastor, a remarkable human being. And we were traveling in Japan for my last book and uh, Wind Rider production was uh, filming us and we were in Shibuya and it was, uh, we were drenched because it was, it was pouring. And, and yet we, we, did, we shot this uh, footage um, just outside of where the uh, famous crosswalk is in Shibuya. Uh, Lost in Translation was filmed there, right? So, yes. so we were like excited, you know, just, just filming. And then uh, just exhausted, right? We got in a taxi to go, go get back to the hotel. And uh, Susie has a little boy, Emmanuel, who uh, is now uh, in his teens. Uh, and um, he, he's also a drummer, a soccer player. He's made one of many things, but he was in the taxi with us and it was really tight because I was sitting in front. Uh, Emmanuel was on Susie's lap. Andrew and his his buddy Nao, who is a also a tap dancer, were carrying this tap. Um, uh, what do you call it? This like platform, flat. You know, like 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 a wooden platform where they dance on, right? To tap dance to make make sound, and so that it was like in in the taxi. You know, like completely like we're all packed in. And and the taxi driver was this this just classic Japanese taxi driver with white gloves. You know, he's been driving the taxi for like 50 years, you know. And and so he, you know, he he was very polite and he said, you know, I said, can I sit in front because we don't have space in the back? And he just, you know, opened the space for me. And and so you know, it was it was a short ride, actually, it was like 15 minutes. And and um, I said, you know, you, you, we have drummers and uh, tap dancers in the back, you know, and just to tell him that. And he said, you know, he was silent for a while and he said, you know, my wife was a drummer and um, she passed away last summer and I still don't know what to do with the drums. That was it, you know. And so I turned around and told Susie and, and, and people, you know, we have a taxi driver whose wife was a drummer and, uh, and I was telling him about Susie's career and jazz and so forth. And he knew some of the musicians and I mean, he's heard of them, you know. Mm -hmm. And as we were just about to get to the hotel, um, you know, maybe about five minutes before, uh, I hear this tapping in the back <laughs> because there was a tap board and uh, apparently it was Emmanuel who started this. And and Susie joined, you know, started percussing in, in the back, and 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 Andrew and they all started tapping. <laughs> this is all concert, 
in, in the back of the taxi driver because they wanted to respond in some way to uh, this taxi driver. And, and then, you know, the music continued when we stopped and, you know, they, they were just, and, and we got out of a taxi and, um, and I, I, you know, I, I, I paid uh, with a credit card and the way this taxi driver just took my credit card, it was, it was like, talk about something precious and sacred, you know, it was like, it was a credit card, but he took it with both hands with his white gloves, you know, bowed down deeply and, and, you know, when he looked up, he had tears in his eyes. And he said, thank you. Isn't music amazing? And he, you know, he went through the credit card machine, gave me the credit card, you know, just as uh, ceremonially as, as he took it. And, and, um, and, you know, we didn't, we didn't, uh, I said, thank you. I, I don't have words. <laughs> and later on, I was talking to the gang about it. And I said, you know, that was new creation. Mm. We didn't have a sermon. We didn't, you know, and and it wasn't even like intended to be anything but a spontaneous response to this man's wife, uh, tribute to his wife that we didn't know. <laughs> it was a 15 minutes of, of taxi ride, but we tapped into new creation. And that sound that Emmanuel started is going to remain forever um, and it'll be multiplied in new creation. And um, when we experience that, we know that this narrative of the gospel is true <laughs> because we hear it, you know, and, and the taxi driver probably had no connection with Christianity, right? But we were able to uh, touch his soul with his, with his music. And I don't know what God is going to do with that. Um, I pray that God will do, you know, um, will generate something new, but, but it doesn't matter. Because, you know, it, it's part of uh, kind of this Isaiah 60 way of inviting the kings of, of the world to bring in their treasures. It doesn't say they're Christians, you know, <laughs> they're all carrying treasures into New, New Jerusalem. And I think that's what can happen when the artists take the deed, you know, when a child leads the way and starts just tapping, um, you know, and, and that, that to me is, um, is such a sacred moment uh, that, that will endure and mul be multiplied in new creation. Thanks for sharing that um, in person. It, it, it's captured just as powerfully in the book and um, I can't think of a better um, way to end this time, but with a thank you, this book is yeah. beautiful. It's, thank you. Um, I, I hope that anyone who is listening will uh, grab a copy and um, there will be a, a raffle. So if you want to comment on the, on the video, awesome. um, yeah. there'll be copies given out for free for the first yeah. people to respond. And um, yeah, I just hope that uh, this will bless as many people as it's blessed me. Thank and, you. Um, just yeah. thankful for your time today. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank yeah. yeah. So, so. That's, that's thanks for, for joining us. Yes, absolutely. Thank and you. Thanks everybody for being here. Yes. Bye.